Before we get started, if you are interested in CBD or finding a new CBD supplier, I've partnered with Hopewell Farms and you can get 10% off this very high quality CBD. I take it every single day. It helps with meditation. It helps with my health in general and we have 10% off with code LILY10 in the description. Also announcing the Ultimate DNA Activation Kit, which is a kit that I've included everything that I did to help activate my DNA, activate new psychic gifts and abilities with nine channeled sessions from the Pleiadians, Lyrans, Syrians, Inner Earth, and other beings to help you activate your DNA, raise your frequency and consciousness, align with your highest purpose and highest potential. I also have cord cutting and ancestral healing workshops, how to connect with your star family, a shorter DNA activation, and other other resources available with the link in the description. Tonight we welcome Drago Reed, who is a level two QHHT practitioner, also a SSP Black Ops experiencer and my lab abductee. He is also a researcher and investigator. Tonight we'll be talking about some of his secret space program experiences, and we will also be deep diving into the Anunnaki and their history with Earth and humanity. Please welcome Draco Reed. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Starseed Chats. Tonight, I have Draco Reed here with me. Um, I'm super excited to be interviewing Draco. Uh, he does um, quantum hypnosis, Dolores Cannon's quantum healing hypnosis technique, um, and is also a secret space program experiencer and a contactee, I believe, too. Um, so yeah, and Draco, you have been studying the Anunnaki for quite a while, so I'm super excited to dive into all of those topics. Thank you so much for coming on, Drago. How are you? Doing really awesome, man. Super excited to be on your show. We've been talking about this for a while, and we got to discover what connections we have to these programs and these visions you've been getting. Yeah. So I'd like to keep this like an, an interview, yes, but also kind of a discussion, more kind of like a little bit of a back and forth. So um, just a little bit of context for the audience. Uh, recently, you kind of came on my radar. I started seeing you on social media and you do uh, you started a, a new show on Rumble with Laura Eisenhower. Uh, is it called The Rebel Collective? Yes. On Rumble? Okay, yeah. So I've been seeing you around on social media just suddenly. And uh, I don't know what I was doing. I think I might have been like laying down for bed or meditating or something. And then I just received like a very vivid vision of you and was basically told you need to reach out and, you know, connect. And then I was like, okay, what's going on here? So I know. And right before this, um, I got some, some telepathic messages that we uh, have worked together before. So I'm so yeah, so now here here we are <laughs> talking. So, uh, but anyways, let me know what for the audience. Can you tell us what's your background and kind of how did you? Yeah, a little bit of background and how did you get into all of this? It's hard to summarize my life. I've often attempted to do that, and I've I've just I've never fully succeeded because it's so convoluted and multifaceted. It's just like how do you sum up so many experiences in sixty mm -hmm. seconds or less? Ultimately, um, I'm a lifelong experiencer in the, uh, the MyLab uh, Black Op programs, and uh, that's basically the MK Ultra program. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had a lot of, I had childhood memories growing up, and it made me really recluse, and it made me become a loner because the times that I tried talking about this stuff to people, no one really understood, and they thought I was crazy because, like, what are the odds that that actually happened to a real person, even though they heard it on a science fiction movie or something like that. Right. So just years of trying to figure out what happened to me allowed me to deep dive the mysteries of the universe. And it brought me to QHHT and I discovered Dolores Cannon. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's funny when I came across her, I had seen her a thousand times in my Facebook or Instagram feed and I'd scroll right past her because in the beginning, she just looked like she was a woman with a perm and like an older woman. And like, I'm not going to click on that video. 
You know what I'm saying? Like she didn't look that intriguing to me, you know, just like just scrolling wise. And I noticed over time, she just kept popping in my feet. I'm like, I'm getting this weird vibe that I need to go down this rabbit hole with Dolores Cannon and see who she is. And then when I did, I realized that I felt like I was revisiting something that I did in other lives, mm -hmm. especially when I started seeing the process of what QHHT was. And before I got certified to do QHHT, I actually followed this hypnotherapist named Alba Weinman in Miami. And she got her start in QHHT and then she kind of started her own technique and did her own thing. But I basically deep dived four or 500 hours of her sessions that she put online of the recordings. And I got more answers in those videos and those sessions than I ever did my entire life. Wow. And I realized knowing these things about people healed parts of myself. Mm -hmm. So I came to this conclusion that when you watch these recordings of these sessions there's activation codes in it no matter who watches it and there's a message for you in each one and you have no idea you're being led to it but there's something there for you and it just it just it just woke me up and fast forward now um i've done over 500 individual person sessions with qhht and it's getting to the point where I'm getting so known in QHHT that I'm verifying a lot of people in the secret space program, MK ultra satanic ritual abuse cults. A lot of my clients have been raped. So like, this is something that I am really intimately connected with because with MK ultra, when you're a, a secret supposed to have black ops experiencer, you go through some extremely traumatic stuff. Right. And uh, I guess this allowed me to connect with everyone in a way that, most people can't connect to people because unless you've witnessed or been through these scenarios, it's really hard to truly connect with someone and say you understand when in fact you don't because right. you don't know what they went through. Um, halfway through my awakening, I had a traumatic motorcycle crash in 2005 in April and I uh, got a traumatic brain injury and my legal diagnosis is traumatic brain injury, post-amnesic disorder with retrograde amnesia and a form of savant syndrome. So basically I end up losing most of my childhood mm. around 25. So a lot of those memories that I grew up with trying to repress and talk about and a lot of it got blocked and I only had pieces. And since 2005, I've had pieces come back, but it's it's really hard to only have pieces of what happened to you when you used to remember what happened. So QHHT allowed me to figure out what happened to myself. So when I first started, started having people put me under, we started re recovering these memories because part of that traumatic brain injury, again, I have legal amnesia. I lost most of my childhood. So anything from like birth to age 13 is pretty much gone. Yeah. And some of those memories I've recovered through either activations or triggers that gave me those memories or mm -hmm. QHHT. And now fast forward to now, I started the show with Laura's, Laura Eisenhower on May 15th of this year. And since then it has been a freaking wild ride, man. And I'm meeting so many people that remember me from these programs. It's mm -hmm. insane how many people remember me and I'm remembering some of these people so for the first time in my life, I'm to the point where I don't feel so alone. Mm -hmm. And not, since people are remembering me, we're, t we're, we're telling these stories amongst each other and we're trying to both remember what the hell happened. And the more I talk to these people, the more the memories activate. Mm -hmm. So everybody's getting thrown in my life right now because I came forward and I'm in the middle of that right now. And it's freaking amazing. It's crazy, isn't it? <laughs> it's pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty wild. I had no idea that this is where I would, you know, be. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's pretty incredible. So I wanted to ask you while you were sharing your story, what um, what kind of made you? You said you said you were trying to figure out what happened to you. What kind of like weird things came up in your childhood? If you, if you can remember them, that made you think, okay, that's, that wasn't quite normal. What's really going on there. 
Can you like think of anything or, or did, had you really no idea? You just always felt different. And then once you started doing like this, the sessions, then the memories started coming up. Well, the thing is I come from a military family. The guy that ended up raising me, my stepdad, my real dad, I didn't actually know about till I was 13 years old. My mom out of nowhere basically said, Oh, by the way, the guy that raised you is not your father. You have this other guy that's your father. So I'm like, what? Wow. But anyways, that's a military family. All his sons are all military, which my brothers as well, like half brother, step brother. And the one thing I know is I've always been military since a kid. And I always thought it was normal to be military, being that I came from a military family. And I thought it was normal for a kid to go out to the woods looking for targets, wearing camouflage, painting his face. Like, I remember one of the most distinct memories I have of childhood is going out to the woods myself in fatigues and laying in the rain, allowing ants to bite me in the forest, frozen, looking for a target, waiting for a target, knowing a target will never come, but something in me was trained for patience and disassociation. So I can lay there in the rain, getting bit by insects and not have a physiological or emotional reaction to it and just be content and just be super focused on what my target will be. And the thing is like that, mil that military mentality never left. Mm -hmm. I've always been military. All the past lives I've ever found out through QHHT, a large amount of them are military. Mm -hmm. And it turns out through QHHT, I found out that I made an agreement before I incarnated to be in the MK ultra secret space program, specifically Monarch, because part of that agreement, <laughs> it's funny. We don't know what we're doing on the other side till we were physically here in the physical, what that's going to entail. But basically I made an agreement to go through the most traumatic torture period. And that would make me special. It would activate things in me that you can only have done through extreme torture. And it basically unlocks part of your DNA. And it also brings gifts from other incarnations into this body. There's something about DNA that holds all your life memories of other lives. Mm -hmm. And it's encoded through light from your light body into the physical body. Because the physical body is basically, it's almost basically like mathematical information that's interpreted from the light. And then it makes a blueprint of what that energy is. So when I entered the earth realm, I was immediately targeted as a person dealing with portals. Mm -hmm. And the first memory I have when I, I think it was around six, maybe six, five or six. I remember the grays abducting me and the grays have been with me my entire life. But part of that memory, I found out years later, it was a screened memory. Mm -hmm. It was actually the military. It was a military abduction. And they gave me a screen military to make me think it was the grays. Wow. So my lifelong connection with that is I've been in and out of the dumbs my entire life, even till today. Mm. Most of the time when I wake up, I think, was I abducted? Right before mm -hmm. I go to bed, I think, will I be abducted, taken to the dumbs? And it led me to Tampa, Florida. And I thought that that choice was my own. And then in the end, I figure out that the dumb that they have me in the most is actually in Tampa mm. and it's MacDill Air Force Base, which is also known as United States Special Operations Command. Mm. That's basically the military hub of all the four facets of the United States military, Marines, Army, Air Force, all that stuff. And it's all a homogenized unit in one mega location. Mm. And um, the more I started having remote, do remote viewing done, with US SOCOM, some of the remote viewers weren't comfortable telling mm -hmm. me the truth and they told me that it's classified. Wow. So when you have a remote viewer tell you it's classified, that means they are literally scared to tell you the truth because they will in implicate themselves on something that's in a classified program. So it just makes it all the real when you have all these projects done by notable remote viewers and like they're verifying your story and like some of the answers you want, you can't get because unfortunately it can lead to people getting killed over this. Right. So it's a, it's a really touchy subject. Yeah. Yeah. That's why 
a lot of the time, whenever I get any like memories or communication, I'm like, am I even supposed to know this? <laughs> Is it safe to know this? <laughs> but uh, also, yeah. So, so are you saying uh, you had people do some remote viewing projects to see what you were doing in the dumps, or have you had any memories? Do you have any idea what you've been doing in the dumps? I have a ton of memories. Okay. And a lot of those memories are negative. Mm -hmm. The things they made me do as a child and what kind of soldier I am and like just the things they make you do, you have no control. You have to do it. If you don't do it, they'll kill you. They'll put you in a clone body. Mm -hmm. And if you don't do what they want, they just torture your clone body. Or they'll, they'll take my actual human body and physically abduct me, put me in the dumps, and then put me through torture. So I've been tortured every way you can imagine. Every way. There's, I don't think there's a way that I've not been tortured. Like, to me, all that's normal to me, to be tortured. And what it did, it made me really strong. It allowed me to take large amounts of pain and transmute it. Yeah. And damn near dis dissociate. So that's tough because like i said with the whole soldier part like i can't turn that off i've always been a soldier my entire life when i walk through life if someone was to remote view me they would see i'm a soldier 24 hours a day and i can't be turned off like i have to pretend i'm a human being that's regular with a regular life but ultimately i'm a government asset that gets pulled on a regular basis to do jobs <laughs> and the only way out of this is my natural death and I don't even think my natural death will allow me to go back to source because some of these programs, the way the cloning works is they figured out a way to capture your soul. And when it's released from the body, they can contain it through an electromagnetic device. So if I'm ever on an op, no matter where I am, if I die in that body and that clone body, that's basically me. Now, when I say clone, I mean, the clone is me. All the organs are real. The skin is real. It is literally me. There are no mechanical parts in, my, in, in the clones unless they have the parts where they inject drugs. You might have a port on some of these clones where they inj inject drugs that put you in different states to make you easier to comply with certain orders and stuff. But with that technology, I felt that even if I die in this life, they can just take my soul and rehome it and put in something else. So it's something I've struggled with my entire life because I've died so many ways mm -hmm. that I no longer even fear death yeah. period. Yeah. I, whenever I first started discovering this and in in about the cloning and all of that and realizing that I had been taken in these programs as well, I asked how many clones I, I had and I just saw like thousands so, 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 so many. Um, but I wanted to ask you about the, about kind of like the, them t being able to take your consciousness. If a, if a, if you die, if a clone version of you dies, take your consciousness and just put you in another one. When will that end? Do you think? When does that end? Whenever the awakening is complete? Well, you have to understand. <laughs> We had an awakening 75,000 years ago, and it's part of the grand solar cycle. There's three many parts of the grand solar cycle, and that's known as the precession of the equinox or the 26,000 year event that we have. It's 25,920 years to be exact. And typically at the end of each precession of the equinox, a single revolution around our main sun, we typically will have a on the way back, we, we are eligible to go to the next dimension. If we've learned our lessons, we've integrated the karma, we've done all that. Mm -hmm. The problem is around 75,000 years ago for the grand cycle, the Draco were there and other beings were there when people were releasing their physical forms and going into spirit to go to the next dimension, the next level, the next whatever reality they signed up for after they processed all their karma. And they started trapping the souls when they were leaving the planet. Jesus. So a lot of the souls here 
a lot of them are first timers because they got through the filters of that control. And a lot of us are here, not me specifically, but I've been here a lot in different lives. I've been in Egypt, Atlantis, all that stuff. So I've been at the epics of all these major events on earth. So I could store this information for an event at the end where I can have everything culminate together and I could bring all the skills of all my lives together into one physical body. And part of that agreement that I did, the reason I volunteered to go through all this is because I needed to store the essence of that torture and what these people are capable of in my light body. So then I can awaken others and start my show and speak about this. And I think it was five or six years ago within my... I don't know how many sessions I had in the beginning. And I remember that one of the sessions, it really freaked me out because it showed me my future. Mm -hmm. And it showed me that I would have a show with Laura Eisenhower. And it showed me how big I got and how I inspired change in people. But it also showed that my private life came out. Yeah. Meaning that everything I've tried to suppress my whole life and not talk about starts coming to the forefront. Admitting to things I never wanted to admit. Like there's certain things that happens in the programs. No one wants to talk about. And now I'm here to show that power and to speak about those things. Cause I'm past the judgment. I'm past people's opinions. I no longer care about people's opinions. If you think negative of, of me, more than likely you don't know me in person. If you know me in person, you know that even though I've been through these traumatic things, I have a really huge heart and I only focus on love. I don't focus on the negativity and all the darkness in the world. I focus on the light and the love. And the one thing that keeps me grounded is animals and life. Like I constantly will watch Instagram videos of animals just in the wild or just animals showing animals love or animals eating or just, just existing without the complexities of the human domain dominating everything. So I'm here now, but ultimately the part of that, when I was showing my future, they said it was imperative that I do not tell Laura that we're going to have a show. Mm -hmm. And the only way it works is if the idea comes from Laura herself. And keep in mind, me and Laura has been friends for over a decade. Wow. We've, we've seen each other all the events. We've always kept in touch behind the scenes. And like, we've talked about private stuff that we don't talk about private to most people. And that's why we trust each other because her and I have that. It's it's like that mutual respect that I wouldn't dishonor her or speak about sensitive topics that's not for the public, if that makes sense. And the funny thing is me and Laura was on a walk one day. I was tattooing her for like two or three days at my shop in Tampa. And we went through this random walk and she's like, Drago, we got to start a show. I'm like, <laughs> I remember my eyes got big. <laughs> and I remember it. I said this, I closed my eyes and I said in my mind, this is the moment that I was shown. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't believe that was the, I, I have goosebumps right now. My hair's standing up, but I'm I, to be told that five years, six years before that. And then it happened the way they said it would happen. And then that my rise, how I'm getting so known so fast mm -hmm. and everybody's coming out of the woodwork, remembering me from these programs it's like I was put on this accelerated path where all these alignments would start seeking me immediately the moment I stepped forward into that truth. But the fear kept me back for the longest time. So now I'm in that truth, living it. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's incredible. I love that. And also, I love that you are a tat tattoo artist. I might have to come down to Florida and visit you and get a tattoo. <laughs> That'd be awesome. I've been tattooing since almost the end of the 90s. So that's a pretty wow. good time to be a tattooer. I've been tattooing well over half my life. I love it. Uh, my dad was a tattoo artist growing up, so I grew up around it. <laughs> it's a fun lifestyle, man. It's just like I've seen 18 countries because tattooing paid for it. Like every dream I've ever achieved, tattooing did that. So taking that art and everything that my light body is, it's a, it's creator energy. I come from something called the golden Phoenix fire. 
-hmm. And what that is, it's a, a hierarchical kind of structure where you create other beings, you create universes, you create the physics, the roles of those universes. And the, the weird thing is that it brought like the father out of me. Like I, I'm 44 years old and I've never had a kid in this life. And I've always, I've often referred to people as my children. And I've always thought of that as freaking odd. I remember I was talking to somebody, a group of people, and one of them, somehow I mouthed out the words, something about, I said, my child. And right when I said that, I was like, why the hell did I say that? It was so weird. Yeah. So it's like, I see the entire human or the, the world population as my children. Yeah. Even though I am the child. Yeah. But I feel this need to help. When I do shows, I give analogies as if I'm talking to a six-year-old child. And that's what Einstein says. If he said, if you can't convey an idea to a child, you truly don't know nothing about that subject. So I realized one day that these analogies are for the children. The children will be watching my shows when I pass. And I will be inspiring a change that it's hard to even fathom. And that's one of the things that I was shown in that QHHT show, the impact I will make on this planet. And it is freaking huge. And it was a lot of pressure for me to see that for the first time and see that my past comes out and like, it was a lot, man. It's like saying, Hey, I'm gonna light this big ass fire. I'm going to need you to just walk into it without stopping. Just walk into that fire and see what happens. Yeah. So I did. Yeah. That's amazing. So I have a question, uh, with the programs. So, I mean, how many of us do you think there are <laughs> out of the starseed community too? Do you feel like there's a pretty damn good amount of people who have been taken into these programs and maybe they will, uh, the time is starting to come while there's, I had no idea until I was like smacked right in the face with it about almost two years ago. And it, and then it took me another six months of denial before I was ready to accept that something like that had happened. But um, yeah, do you feel like there's uh, a lot of people who are in the programs that are about to wake up? Intuitively, I feel that there's hundreds of millions yeah. and that more people are a part of this and it's become an archetype for this planet mm -hmm. where they abduct you and you have no idea about it. Because most people, they're not meant to know these memories right? because anyone can say, I'm not in a government program. I've never been anything like that. Ultimately, you have no idea what you've been in because the blank slate technology they use, they remove all your memories and they can remote view the future for possibilities of you talking or any of the blank slating not working. And then they can readjust that stuff to make sure that optimal timeline means that you're asleep your entire life and the mission you had on this planet to achieve never happened. And that basically you thought you're this regular human, the whole universe is chaos and I'm living this random life. I went through this random set of events and then I die. But the entire time you were under this veil, not realizing you were part of something deeper and more important because you weren't authorized to have those memories. Or there might have been a certain program running in you where you never even thought about it. Mm -hmm. And you have to realize this planet is an indoctrination planet now. It's been taken over. It used to be a good planet, but the problem is the dark kind of took over it. And they put they put almost like a reality over a reality. They took something that was created by source, and then they created and overlaid it with something that man made. Mad made technology overlaid, you can call it the matrix. Yeah. Even though all this is an illusion and technically we're not in two separate locations right now and we're looking into this computer, technically the computer don't even exist. Mm -hmm. We're all just one mind. And we're all here to basically separate ourselves into male and female and all these different archetypes so source can figure out what it's capable of. How far can it go? What can it experience? What can it achieve? And this is where most people are, are at right now. And they don't realize that they're part of a deeper picture and they have this 
veil of forgetfulness over them. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the people that I put under with QHHT, none of them suspected they were in programs. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, I keep getting sent people that are in the programs. Yeah. And a lot of these are major people, mm -hmm. like major show hosts and all that stuff. And they had no idea they were connected to this. And one interesting one was Matthew Mornian. He runs mm -hmm. Remember Your Mission on YouTube. And mm -hmm. uh, he's, a, he's a fun guy. And uh, he ended up coming to my house. He lives in Florida as well. And I, did, I gave a session to him. It was a five-hour session where he was under like five hours. Wow. Normally, I put someone under an hour and a half two hours max. Wow. This was a five hour session. What we uncovered in five hours blew both our minds. He was shown that he was in the dumps with me and we went through all these different programs and he didn't know what to think about that when he woke up. Cause it, at, to this point, he never considered that he was in those types of programs and he was here to uncover those programs through his show and talk to other people and not even realize he was an experiencer. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the people I'm coming across mm -hmm. when I put them under, I ask, are they in a government program? Is there another life going on outside of their current memories that's being blocked? A lot of QHHT practitioners don't ask this question. They get shown typically a past life or the current life, depending on how bad your current life is. Most people get shown another life. Mm -hmm the most traumatized get shown their current life from the past, typically from childhood or right. teenage years. And that one moment affected them to the adult they are today. So I would say those are more seldom versus people getting shown otherworldly existences or them in extraterrestrial bodies or them in Atlantis. Like, so I get all the cool sessions. Yeah. And I've came to this conclusion that Dolores has this term called digging potatoes. And that's what you would describe as an average QHHT session where, no, I can't say the average. I would say that sometimes people get shown a mundane life where basically nothing major happened. They were shown their birth. They, they, they went through their entire life. They went to the day of their death, but nothing really happened. Mm -hmm. And, I don't get a lot of those anymore. Yeah. And it seems like there's two different types of QHHT practitioners. One are the esoteric and occult versed, meaning that they've done the inner work. They've studied the ancient civilizations. They know about extraterrestrial existences. Then you have the other people, meaning that they don't know a lot about these realms and the times that they're presented a client and they're talking about extraterrestrial stuff, that session might contradict what their belief pattern is. Mm -hmm. They might be a fundamentalist Christian and think that there is no reincarnation. But right. truly, if you study the Bible, go back farther. You can read the Pista Sophia. You start reading the Sumerian tablets, which talked about Jesus. And Jesus taught his inner circle reincarnation is real. It was the Catholic Church that took out reincarnation. And they did this in 325, the Council of Nicaea. And then in 750 AD, they made it illegal to believe in reincarnation, punishable by death. Wow. So before modern times, reincarnation was something we talked about openly to the masses. Mm -hmm. And it was basically in Lil, his other name is Yahweh of the Old Testament. They removed a lot of those connections because it was a mechanism of control. If you tell people that their life is finite mm -hmm. and when they die, there's nothing that doesn't really make you want to live life because it's like, it's a lot of pressure. You have this one single life and everything that happens, you think is chaos and it could be nothing but catastrophe. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like you punish yourself because you never truly did anything in life. And to think that when I die, I had no purpose. Mm -hmm. I, I did nothing notable and then I die, that can really mess the soul up. Yeah. Yeah. So I actually wanted to uh, talk about the Anunnaki and ask where do the Anunnaki fit in all of this? 
I would say the Anunnaki starts with the Orion Wars and what an event that went back to the Draco invading Lyra. Mm -hmm. And I believe that the Anunnaki are the orig are original inhabitants of Lyra before they had to disperse to other star systems during this war with the Draco. And they went to Sirius, didn't they? Yeah, one of their one of their biggest outposts is Sirius B. Okay. That's why they depict a lot of the Sirius stars in a lot of our Sumerian depictions, along with the Pleiades. So two of the biggest strongholds of the Anunnaki is the Pleiades and the Sirius star system. Okay. So, for example, like Sirius Radio, all these brands show you the membership of who they're connected to. So Sirius Radio, Sirius is known as the dog star. Marduk means the son of the dog. Mar is the son of and Duke is dog. So they're showing you the connection and personifying it as Sirius the dog looking up to the stars because that's the logo. So their story is embedded all throughout culture. It's everywhere. Their symbols are everywhere. The Anunnaki symbol is the cross. Then you mix that with the X. You put that together. That's the cardinal directions. The Anunnaki brought forth the directions. They brought forth mathematics, mathematics and the introduction of time. They invented time. Before time, the construct, we just existed. And we didn't measure it all like they do because when they invented time, it's, it's, a, it's a way to have commerce pay off the maximum. Meaning that if you can have a group of souls meet an exact sliver of the rotation of the sun in the sky, you can get the maximum amount of work and or money from creating that time structure. But also the second thing you do is you, you inadvertently convince the person and the human that they're living life in a linear fashion, mm -hmm. but time is not linear. Mm -hmm. It's all a construct. And for example, like when you sing someone, the birthday song, at that point, the soul's forced to acknowledge the physical year and accepting it. Therefore, their body ages one more year, starting with that song. Mm -hmm. So you'll see a lot of young people that don't necessarily celebrate birthdays. Some, some just say, I don't really celebrate my birthday. I don't focus on it. A lot of those people, they look young as hell. Mm -hmm. And it's a subconscious program. So again, it's a spell. You're, you're, you're singing out a spell trapping them in time mm -hmm. so that's one of the reasons i don't like singing birthday songs to people because i know it's an anaconda anunnaki trap and it, it, it's jacked that a lot of our i'm not good with small words due to my dyslexia i'm really good at the complicated stuff my my brain injury i have trouble with small words but like <laughs> it's hard for me to sum all that up mm -hmm. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no worries. So let's go to, I'm curious about the Orion. So for me personally, the Anunnaki, like I knew about, you know, the kind of like the basics. You know, they came to Earth, kind of like the ba the basic well-known story. They came to Earth looking for gold and then helped create humanity that. But I never um, really felt called to dig into them any further. I just had an innate feeling like it's not time yet. And then more recently now I've kind of been getting kind of like memories and things like if like downloads and, and, and stuff about that. Um, and also Orion's been coming up a lot. So let's go to um, you said that it started with the Orion Wars with the Anunnaki or well, it started with Lyra, you know, in, in the invasion. But then can you tell me what you know about like the Anunnaki and the Orion Wars? The Orion Wars is over a portal that's located in Orion's belt and to this day, it's still militarized there. It's still protected. And mm -hmm. this was one of the main hubs of them coming into this system. It's part of the invasion. Mm -hmm. And we had all these subgroups that originally left Lyra in over millions of years of going through these wars. This was millions and billions of years. This is not something that happened in like 500 years. Right. Now, when I say millions and billions... There is no concept of time outside of all this. So a couple of million years, you have to realize some of these beings, they have a lifetime 
where they live 500,000 years. Mm. Can you imagine what a life would be like if you lasted 500,000 years versus like our 70 year old max? Like, right. It's, it's insane, but basically it was, it was just a battle that got out of control from all these different groups that colonized different planets. And they were all warring with each other for resources. And through all that, we had nuclear war through the nuclear war. Some of these planets started losing their atmospheres and the Anunnaki, their planetoid Nibiru, it's not really, a, I wouldn't say it's classified as a planet. I would say Nibiru is kind of more like a death star. And from all my study as the Anunnaki were in charge of a lot of this part of this sector of this universe. And mm -hmm. when the Draco came, they were actually dumped in Alpha Draconis. They did not originate from there. They were dumped there. And in their genetic memory, they mostly remember Alpha Draconis and one of their biggest strongholds there is Thuban. That's basically their main outpost and planet where the queen is. And our planet Earth is basically an amalgamation between Draconian rule and Anunnaki rule. So all of our world religions were mostly started by the Anunnaki. Mm -hmm. Almost all of them. Even the ones that are polar opposites of the main religions, the ones that would battle, it was created by the Anunnaki as a form of perpetual control of the planet so like yahweh started christianity and that's in lil that's in lil that's the most evil of the anunnaki brothers then you have enki and what, what? And wanted to wipe out humanity so the bible is a book about the view of the most evil brother fighting the lesser brother mm -hmm. if that makes sense mm -hmm. So his his brother he would call him Lucifer, hmm. and his another name is Archangel Michael. People don't realize that the archangels they are Anunnaki, like they are from the house of El. El is God, the highest God is called Elion or Anu, and the word angel it ends in El. Archangel ends in El. Almost all the angels' name end in El. They are the house of El. So you had Enlil have Christianity. He fought against Jesus. He was not the father of Jesus. If you read something older than the Old Testament, you read the Pista Sophia. And Jesus said, Enlil is not the true father. He is a flesh and blood being that can die and he's controlling people. And he was there to show people Yahweh and Key's control, um, Yahweh and Enlil's control. And that was ultimately the fight. And Enlil literally had Jesus crucified and killed. Mm -hmm. And we think, like if you think about it, if you add up all the people that Yahweh was responsible for killing, it, it adds up to over 6 million people. Just combining a couple of Bibles and other texts, it's over 6 million. Mm -hmm. Because remember, Yahweh, he didn't like other gods. He was extremely jealous. He told his emissaries, when they get to certain lands, murder all the men, take the women and children as sex slaves, eat the other bodies. Like it was heavily based on cannibalism, which is not talked about a lot. And like a lot of the offerings that Yahweh would take would be physical flesh. I don't know how many times in the Bible where you had to give tribute a human body that was either alive or you had to kill it yourself. And, and they, they took literal flesh tributes. So if you think about it, if, you tr if you're a Christian and you truly read the Bible, you cannot tell me that Yahweh is good. And if you do, you are programmed and you are blind. I would say reread the Bible. And this time, truly read the Bible. So that's what I did when I was young. I started reading the Bible and I started realizing this is some dark stuff. Mm -hmm. It's like kill this person. Kill, kill, kill. Burn Sodom and Gomorrah. Kill the innocent. Take the little boys to chop the heads of their penises off and circumcise them, which was a symbol of the slavery. So, like, there's all this negative stuff that was being done in humanity. And to finish that story, it was in Lil Yahweh, he sent Angel Gabriel. And the, the Gabriel 
name is actually a propaganda position. He was sent to Muhammad to start Islam. It was Archangel Gabriel who went to Muhammad that forced Muhammad to read and write to then dictate what the religion would be that would then be the antithesis of Christianity. So you have these two different warring religions that are constantly fighting and there's never an end. Like Allah, for example. Allah is the son of one of the Anunnaki. You know, mm -hmm. and then the Anunnaki appeared as Marconi when he went to Joseph Smith to start Mormonism. So you have all these religions and cults started by the Anunnaki. You have the entire education system, the medicine system. Everything is Anunnaki. This is by all intents purposes an Anunnaki planet. But it always it always wasn't. Like they only hijacked this place, I would say, 450 to 500,000 years ago. And before they arrived, there were already genetic programs running here. Before then, we had Homo sapiens. And when they edited us 200 to 250,000 years ago, suddenly Homo sapiens sapiens comes out of nowhere. Even lesser brain volume. We had mm -hmm. our chromosomes altered. Our, we, had, we had telomere caps put on our chromosomes. And they even left the mark of the Anunnaki in our DNA. They left their symbol. You can literally see the symbol in our DNA as a signature showing that they own us. Wow. So are there any benevolent Anunnaki? Yes. There are there are there are factions of all sides, kind of like people say that Draco are all evil. That's a lie. Right. That is not true because all beings have a spark of light inside their heart. Even the Draco. The problem is with the Draco, their heart chakra was cut off as part of their genetic engineering. They were genetically engineered as well, but they thought they are the highest being, but they're not. They were a creation and then they wrecked so much havoc. They were thrown in a completely other star system because their creators came to the conclusion that these creations are insane. All they <laughs> want to do is dominate. All they want to do is rape. They just want to take, take, take. And that's what they did. They went to Lyra. They seen all of their resources. They came in as friends and then they killed everyone. They mm -hmm. ended up blowing up all these planets, but you mentioned the Anunnaki where they came from. One of the main outposts was a, a planet called Atlan. Mm -hmm. This is where Atlantis comes from. So Atlantis existed first before Egypt. Mm -hmm. A lot of people think that Atlantis is myth mythological, but it's not. You have the Emerald Tablets of Foth. And it's the, those tablets have been dated to be like 33,000 years old. Mm -hmm. And they say humanity started 6, year, 4,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. 4,000 BC, that's that's when we come out of nowhere and we start using animal husbandry, language, mathematics, astronomy, astrology, all that stuff. It just starts out of nowhere at the exact moment. And according to evolution, that would take millions of years to evolve those ideas. And they would not have a central origination point all at once. That is not possible. And I found that out in the Sumerian tablets. So most of my information... It comes from the Sumerian tablets. Mm -hmm. I don't like to get my information from the internet because you got to work. You got to realize the word internet. It's broken down between two words. It's the mm -hmm. word enter as to enter through a door and then net. You're mm -hmm. entering a net of control of information. And once you're in the internet, they control everything you see. They control everything you hear and what you can access. So it's a trap. So what do you th think about, oh, I just had a question. Okay. Um, so with these kind of these negative beings that are the uh, ones with ill attention, the negative Anunnaki, negative uh, Draco, do you think is, is there um, another entity or energy or even like AI that is controlling all of them? What are your yes. thoughts on that? Well, the Sumerian tablets talk about the AI. Do they? Before we even had written language, before we even had stories and history, there was stories about the AI huh. and about how the AI is actually billions of years old, mm -hmm. older than most civilizations. So this artificial thing was created billions of years ago. Goodness and what it did is it started taking over planets. It started consuming planets, energy. It sees humans as food, imperfect. You could see that. 
you can say food because food is energy. Mm -hmm. It consumes. You, I wouldn't say literally consumes our bodies, but it consumes what's within us, like a form of louche. That's a, a nice popular word to use as louche. And every human puts out louche depending on what frequency you're in. And fear frequency manifests really freaking fast. So one thing I've tried to sh show people is stop going into the fear mentality because your thoughts manifest your reality. So if you focus on the fear, the fear is like a bitch slap to the face. It'll come fast. It'll smack you in the face and that pain will linger on your face and it won't go away for a long time. If you focus on the good, it takes longer to manifest love because it's a different frequency and vibration. So fear is almost immediate, right? Love takes a while. It takes a while to find that pursuit of love because most people don't even love themselves. Right. I think it, it takes it takes longer here. Here it takes longer because we're so kind of like cut off. Like whenever I first started connecting with my star family and, you know, they're very, very, very high vibrational, very benevolent star family. I felt so much love. And whenever I first started connecting with the divine, with source, the love that I felt was overwhelming. I was like, I've never felt anything like it. I, I don't have any kids, but I can imagine like maybe like how, you know, a mother would love her child or, or whatever. It could be like the closest thing, but it's, it's really profound and very, very powerful. I'm like, wow, we just don't really feel that on earth. Really. <laughs> it's such a dense place. So um, I, I personally feel that for the planet. I am literally responsible for getting everyone out of this. Part of one of my part of one of my agreements is I put my body on the line, risking death and torture even more mm -hmm. to talk about these things. And one of the things that held me back most of my life was the fear of them doing this again, where next time I don't get to escape. And they put me through this one scenario is probably five, six months ago. And it was the most traumatic experience I remember having. And I remember I did some mushrooms because I needed some clarifications. I need some answers. And in the end, I ended up doing some remote viewing in a session, figure out that they hijacked my mushroom trip. Oh, and man. during that, I got a whole download of a lot of the torture I went through mm -hmm. and what I've done. And I remember it was about a six hour trip and I felt like my mind fractured. Mm -hmm. I'm in my room walking back and forth with a blanket on like you would see a crazy person in a movie. And I was convinced that I would never be the Drago I was before that moment because what I felt in my mind, I felt that there's no way that I can ever come back from it with what they showed me in the way I felt. It was like being trapped in a, you can't even put it into words, you know, like to all that happen to you all at once, just one after another. And it just hits you in a, in an accelerated state of while I'm on psilocybin. So when you're on mushrooms, you feel everything. You're connected to everything. Mm -hmm. So when you access a realm of all that negative stuff when you're on mushrooms, it was really bad. And I didn't really talk about it that much publicly. Mm -hmm. And the next day when I woke up, I felt completely normal. And I could not believe that I was back to myself and that all that stuff I went through was only temporary. Mm -hmm. But that was their warning to me that they were going to do a lot more things to me if I keep talking. Mm. And at that point I realized I don't care no more. Do what you got to do. I'm no longer putting my life off. I'm no longer going to live in fear. And this is what me, Laura, starting this show was about. Laura pulled me out of that darkness and she allowed, she literally metaphorically took me by the hand and pulled me out of that darkness and allowed me to step forward into that light. Good. So I credit her a lot of stuff for helping me come forward for this. Good. That's amazing. That's wonderful to hear. Yeah, I feel like they really, you know, they give you a lot of um, 
trials whenever you first are starting to speak up about things like this. I remember some really crazy things happening to me, but you get through it and then it gets easier. And then you don't really get messed with anymore. I feel like. Yeah, like I can openly talk about these things now without breaking down crying because yeah. a lot of times when you talk about these things, the words won't come out. It's kind of like when you are with someone you love in a relationship and you did something to them that's wrong mm -hmm. and the way they look in you in the eyes, you feel so ashamed or you feel you're trapped in this emotion and you want to say something, but the words won't come out. It's almost mm -hmm. like your voice becomes hoarse and yeah. you try to speak but no matter how much you try, it won't work. It's like it's permanently cut off. Right. Yeah, definitely. There's a lot of um, healing, healing being done right now. Um, I had uh, one other question about um, the Anunnaki. Do you feel like many of us maybe or some of us are reincarnated in uh, Anunnaki? Yes. Mm -hmm. oh, most of the planet that's here is either Martian from Maldek or from a lot of these other planets that went through these wars. Cause when, when Maldek exploded, that's the planet between Mars and Jupiter known as the asteroid belt. That was actually a super planet. Like you can say it's more the size of Jupiter. Like it was massive. Wow. And when it exploded parts of the, planet ends up hitting Mars, which was a moon of the super planet. It wasn't its own standalone planet. It was only a moon. And when that super planet hit it, it knocked out the atmosphere immediately. And I can't even think how many millions of people died immediately. And that was never part of their agreement for what they agreed to, to experience that life. That was not supposed to happen. So that created a problem because number one, that wasn't supposed to happen. So a lot of those souls, they end up reincarnating on earth. So a lot of us here, we have ancestral traces to, to Mars, Maldek, to Lyra, to all these other systems, because we have to heal what was, what had happened to us during these wars. I'm getting chills all over my body, like so hard right now. I knew about Lyra, Atlantis, Mars just came up for me in the last few days. <laughs> like Earth is a piece of the super planet. Wow. We weren't always the third rock from the sun. When that happened, we got kind of knocked into the third position. Wow. That's crazy. So then this is also like a karmic thing. The Anunnaki. What the Anunnaki did, they are responsible karmically for what they did. And a lot of them are reincarnating back to fix what they did. Yeah. And experiencing things like, what did you say, like the, the secret space programs and, and all the, the torture and things like that. Would you agree with that? Or some, in some cases. I would say I something that would be continuing what they did. Some of the Anunnaki are the evil ones that are reincarnating back into positive bodies because they realize that the Anunnaki can't go to their, their next higher dimension because they have all this karma and it's part of the law of one rules. Mm -hmm. When you help co-create something, including modifying other beings, you are literally responsible for them. And what I come from, again, it's called the golden Phoenix fire. Mm -hmm. If my creation starts to revert, where there were humans mm -hmm. and it starts to get negative and revert, meaning going back to animalistic. I am then responsible to reset that creation myself. Yeah. Meaning that I'm responsible for wiping out all those beings that I created. Mm -hmm. So as a creator, you have a responsibility to make sure your creation is the most optimal timeline for a reflection of source. That's what that hierarchy is for. You've shown that you remain in light and you don't do this for a service to self kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Some of those beings ended up doing that. And basically the Anunnaki, they hijacked creator roles from a higher source and they did as above, so below. Like they were never authorized to hijack and to modify us 
to the point where we worship them even till today all the religions like the vatican like they're basically worship worshiping marduk which is the son of enki and they even wear uh, the miter hats which is the sign of enki or oanis that was his name in Bab uh, babylonian mm -hmm. And uh, you could just see all these world religions, they're all mechanisms of control. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, they are still in control of this planet. And this is what we have to uncover and show people that all religions except almost dang near Taoism are mostly mechanisms of control. And they make you think that you're not source or you don't reincarnate and you're just the same as an animal. So uh, what do you think about some of the people who say that um, the Anunnaki will be returning? What are your thoughts on that? Do you have any thoughts on that? Okay, so for a while, a lot of the Anunnaki left. And mm -hmm. the reason they left is because the humans, they couldn't take the fact that these gods not only were bigger than humans, but they were openly controlling the masses. So there was a lot of revolts that happened, especially during the pyramid world wars in Egypt and all that stuff. And the pyramid wars, they went on for a long time. What do you mean pyramid wars? Okay. So after we left Atlantis, after that deluge, there were, there were mechanisms of it. Okay. So Atlantis wasn't just an Island. Atlantis was an entire territory of the planet. Like mm -hmm. Atlantis was a large chunk of the planet because that was the Anunnaki. When they got here, there was these beings called the Lemurians mm -hmm. and they end up warring with the Lemurians and they end up wiping them out. So when they, when, when King Alalu came here, he was the first Anunnaki to get past the asteroid belt because their Nibiru planet X, it exists right outside the rotation of Pluto. And it takes 3,600 years to make a full orbit. And the Anunnaki call it a char. Again, 3,600 years. And after Atlantis happened, they reemerge into Egypt. And Thoth even says it. I am Thoth, king of Atlantis. I basically built the pyramids. And Thoth's face, then his name was Ningashida. In Atlantis, he was called Thoth. So Atlantis, I'm sorry, Egypt, Ningazita, and his face was on the Sphinx. Mm -hmm. And when they went to rebuild after the deluge, the Sphinx was built first. Then the pyramids were built second. But basically all these pyramids were built to restabilize the axis of the planet because of the wars we went in. It actually destabilized the rotational axis of the planet, which mm -hmm. caused the wobble. So when they install all these pyramids along that one latitudinal line, specifically the 33rd parallel, you're going to see that there's all these ancient megalithic sites, all these pyramids that all run together. And it's basically forming a ring around the planet. And that allows them to readjust that wobble and that axis of the planet because If you don't get that, if that wobble is wrong, that is going to cause catastrophes that are one after another. Mm -hmm. So that was basically them trying to correct the reason why they have all these catastrophes and all these deluges, because it was a part of us getting knocked off on, on our axis when we went through this war and Maldek exploded. Hmm. Interesting. Okay, very interesting. I've also had a, um, I've had like a kind of like a memory come up in, in, um, was it, uh, where I was a feline being, a 13 foot tall feline being in ancient Egypt. And something had happened where there was like some sort of an attack and I died. And so whenever you, were you yeah. So the, the goddess Sekhmet, mm -hmm. she was Lyran as well. Yeah. 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 So in Egypt, they personify all us, all these deities where they have a human body, but they have an animal head. 
right. you have to realize that a lot of these star beings, that's what they look like. Yeah. These weren't just literal personifications of an attribute. And they say, in little, we're going to personify you as the bull. And then we're going to, we're going to assign the constellation Taurus to you. Cause that's your constellation. And Marduk was in control of that. Marduk named all the constellations. Huh. Marduk named himself the Ram. That's his constellation, the Ram. So you see how all this works? Like they created all of it. Even our modern cosmology, they created it. So every facet of everything on this planet was co-created by the Anunnaki. Wow. Okay. So with um, you had mentioned before this that you're going to be interviewing somebody who is re Anki reincarnated. Um, do you think that there can be multiple people who are maybe have a part of his consciousness or maybe what Dolores Cannon says, maybe it's been imprinted. Uh, like, like I Joan Hart. Ask if it's an imprint, most QHH people do not ask if they are imprints, meaning an imprint is basically if you Lily was to incarnate on earth and you had a limited amount of lives where you didn't have certain skills or certain memories, mm -hmm. You use an imprint, meaning that if you're here to awaken people and you incarnate in a physical body and you want to have the power that Joan of Arc had, and the memory, you can use her life blueprint and imprint it onto your soul matrix. And by all intents and purposes, you are Joan of Arc because all the memories and the energy of Joan of Arc is there in your body. Yeah. That doesn't mean you were Joan of Arc. It's only an imprint. Yeah. Now, That's literally what happened. <laughs> it was with Joan of Arc. I, I've had, yeah. <laughs> I always like to ask when I put someone under, is this an imprint? Okay. Because I feel that's important. Dolores said it's not important to know that answer, but I disagree because if you tell a being that There's they're not a Joan of Arc, when they know they're Joan of Arc, but they never realized they took – they took the life story and everything that that person ever learned and overlaid it into their soul matrix in order to bring that energy forward to create an awakening. Yeah. They don't like to hear that. Yeah. So, well, and that's why you get multiple people who, who think that they are yes. Joan of Arc reincarnated. Exactly. So, so the question you asked me, is it, are there more people that can be in other bodies? Yes. It's not possible to fit a draconian soul or an Anunnaki soul into a single human body. It's just not possible. Okay. So you have to ha put fractals okay. in different bodies. Okay. So the guy I'm interviewing next, his name is Michael Lee Hill. He's been verified that he is an actual incarnation of Venki through the Nakoda Indian nation by his brother and Lil. And this was his brother in the Indian life he is now. He was verified to be in Lil. Wow. And that the Nakoda Nation, they, they traced their entire lineage of coming from Egypt and Atlantis. And they passed that story on through their oral traditions of those tribes. Wow. And I think Michael, he's, he comes from the Iroquois, which are direct descendants of the original people that came into North America, because a lot of people don't understand that there is a numerous pyramids, pyramids here in the United States. They were called the mound builders and the mound builders were also the pyramid builders. They are one and the same. Yeah. So we so have, all I have the biggest, the biggest mounds in the biggest North, the biggest, Mound City in the whole continent is 45 minutes away from my house. <laughs> Kokia Mounds. Have you heard of it? Yeah, I hear uh, Tyler and Aaron Kuhn talk about the, they had, they make a documentary called the Kokia yep. uh, Mounds and all that stuff. Okay. It's really intriguing stuff because I truly believe that the world is mostly, mostly focusing on Egypt yep. and these other ancient megalithic sites in, in the world. But I think we're going to make more advances in history when we stop focusing on the entire world and we start mapping the United States. Right. I'm actually because going there right after. Covered. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. There's so many treasures in the United States and uh, yeah, I'm actually going to Kokia Mounds right after this interview. 
with Tyler. <laughs> Can I go do some grid work? <laughs> That's freaking amazing, man. <sighs> yeah, it's a it's amazing there. It's it's strong. <laughs> Energy is very strong. Um, okay, well, so that makes so much sense. So you think that uh, just to recap that, like Anki, there could be multiple people who have fractals of his his consciousness or soul living yes. at the same time. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Very, very interesting. Um, man, there's so many more questions that I would like to ask you, but I do have to go to Kogia Mount right after this. <laughs> um, so I guess we can go ahead and wrap it up. Uh, but I would, I think I would like to have you on again. Um, that would rock, man. Yeah. It was so great talking, talking about the Anunnaki. So yeah. Yeah. We could, we could go there's, yeah, there's a bunch of other questions that we didn't get to. So uh, I would love to do a part two. Do you uh, have any kind of like last words that you would like to share with the audience? And then would you like to share uh, where people can find you? Um, I'll be doing a talk in April at the alien event.com. It's at, um, I think it's uh, April 11th to the 14th. I'll be doing two separate talks. One about my secret space program experiences in QHHT and I'll do an, another lecture about the Anunnaki. Wow. Then I'll be doing another talk at the Disclosure Now conference at St. Pete Beach at the Serrata Beach Resort in July, mm -hmm. the second week of April. I'm sorry, the second week of July. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be a lot of super soldiers. Yeah. So if you want to if you want to go down that Anunnaki super soldier realm, that's the show to go to. Yeah. Other than that, that okay. um, I would say follow my show. I have two shows on Rumble. One's with Laura Eisenhower called The Rumble Collective, just Rumble Collective on Rumble. And I just started my own show called Portal to Another Dimension, which discusses my connections and what I've been through in the secret space program with the portal technology that I've developed since a kid. And they've just used me for that my whole life. But if you, ever, if you guys want a QHHT session, you can find me at fractaloflight.com. And all my sessions are in-person only. I do not do beyond quantum healing, meaning that I can do this from the internet. Dolores mm -hmm. Cannon has very specific roles, in-person only. So if you want a next level session, come see me in person, meet me in an event, or you can go to qhhtpractitioners.com to find someone near you. Beautiful. Thank you so much. It was so, so wonderful having you on. And uh, yeah, we'll we'll be in touch. Awesome. I look forward to the next one. Thank you. And everybody, we've been recording for 111 at this time. <laughs> everybody have a good night. Don't forget to like this video, drop a comment, and check out Drago's information. I'll have links in the video description. Take care. Bye. Until next time. Thanks for tuning in. Don't forget to like this video, drop a comment, and I hope you enjoyed the rest of your day. See you later, Star Brothers and Sisters.